All right. I think we're ready to roll. So we say good evening, everybody, and welcome to this information session presented by DIFD and the Royal. We're going to have a really important conversation here about a very important topic, and that is youth mental health. And, you know, these are difficult conversations to have. You know, I, my wife and I, we have two teenage daughters. I'm fortunate enough to coach Ring at, be a, 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 a part-time professor at, uh, at Carleton. So I'm really fortunate to be in the space with young people. And I know how difficult it is for them to navigate this stuff. And it's not it's tough for us to navigate as parents, as coaches, as teachers. And so we want to kind of maybe give you some expert advice in the course of this evening tonight. And uh, this evening, you're going to hear conversations that I have with a youth psychiatrist, two social workers, and a researcher uh, who is focused on suicide prevention. Uh, if you don't know who I am, my name is Ian Mendes. Really pleased to be uh, your host and kind of guide you through these conversations uh, here on this uh, on this night. Um, I'm, I'm always so fortunate when the Royal reaches out uh, to be able to, to use my expertise as a host, as a broadcaster, as a, as a person who uh, is able to navigate conversations in this space. So it's a real honor and a real privilege for me to be sitting here uh, this evening. Before we get started, I think it's important to acknowledge uh, that the Royal Ottawa Hospital, uh, it's on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin people and traditionally known as the Anishinaabe. Uh, Algonquin people are the original inhabitants of the wide swath of territory all across the Ottawa River. So in Algonquin culture, it's appropriate for guests to acknowledge the hospitality of their hosts when entering their territory. So with this tradition in mind, the Royal respectfully thanks Algonquin people for hosting us on their ancestral lands. Um, as we start this, this is a, a, a virtual um, a session. And of course, there's some housekeeping. In fact, uh, the organizers can even tell you that I had all sorts of problems with my speaker and my microphone as if it was like March of 2020. I didn't know what was going on with Zoom here, but I think I'm I'm ready to go. And, uh, you know, if, if you have questions for us, there's a Q&A button there. If you want to jump in at any time, jump in with Q&A. Um, we'll, we'll address some of them during the initial discussion that we have with each of our experts, but we want to let you know that we have specific time set aside at the end of the evening for those Q&A. So we may, able, uh, may be able to answer those questions at that time. And I know there's some pre-submitted ones, so we'll, we'll work through those as the night goes on. As I mentioned, sometimes there's technical difficulties. The easiest thing to do is if you're having a problem with the Zoom feed or uh, you know your feed, just, just jump out, jump back in. That usually solves the problem. But if you're having any other technical issues, we do advise you, you can send an email to communications at the royal.ca. Okay, time to get started. I'm really excited to bring in uh, Dr. Gail Beck. Um, into, for our opening segment here. Dr. Beck, if you don't know, uh, uh, familiar with her work, Clinical Director of Youth psychiatry and the interim chief of staff and psychiatrist in chief at the Royal. Her clinical work is in child psychiatry with a focus on adolescents and young adults. And as I mentioned, that's kind of the age group we're really uh, looking at this evening. Dr. Beck speaks and writes extensively about youth mental health. You can check out her blog at drgailbeck.com. Dr. Beck has received many accolades for her work, including the Queen's Golden Jubilee Medal and Queen Elizabeth II a Diamond Jubilee Medal. She is a member of the Order of Ontario for her work with children and youth. Dr. Beck is going to give us some insights here on the current state of uh, mental health and some of the things we should keep in mind as we try to keep young people in mind with those mental health challenges. So Dr. Beck, thank you so much for uh, for joining us this evening. Well, thank you, Ian, for hosting again. It's good to be here and it's good to see you again. Yeah, and it's it's great. And I know um, I think the theme of this, we, we, you even joked to me before, you said, you know, before you have the conversations, you have to know the situation, right? That's, that's kind of the, uh, the, the premise of our conversation here. So I, I think this is something that, uh, you know, parents, and I mentioned parents, coaches, teachers want to know about, um, how often, or how common, I guess I should say, uh, Dr. Beck, are mental health issues amongst youth right now? So there are a few things we know just in general in the population, and we know that at any given time, about 25% of youth uh, have symptoms of either anxiety and depression, which are the two most common reasons that we see people at the Royal. So that just gives you an idea of the scope, which is really quite significant, one in four kids. You know, one thing that I feel like was a, I don't know if catalyst is the right word, but I'm going to use it, and you can correct me, is the pandemic. 
and I think of March of 2020, and I think of this age group that we talk about, young adults and adolescents and teens, and they just sort of got pushed into something that they didn't know. And, I, and, and we weren't familiar. We didn't know how to navigate it as parents and coaches and teachers. They didn't know how to navigate it. And I'd like to know now, as we are now almost with that four years in the rearview mirror, Dr. Beck, what's been the impact of that? And can we still say that there's a pandemic impact on this on this age group? So maybe I'll just start by, by you mentioned four years. And really, can you believe that it's been four years? No. So let's think about the people who were uh, anywhere from 12 to uh, 16 years old. The age group we're looking at, they're now 16 to 20. That was a quarter to, that was like 20 to like 20 to 25% of their lifetime. Yeah. Since that, and during the pandemic itself, it was like two full years that they were affected. And um, I think that uh, what's interesting is some of the research is showing that there wasn't necessarily a significant impact, but that's not what we're seeing necessarily on the ground. And I expect that part of the reason for that is that it's, it's hard to take everything into account. Uh, I think the first thing that happened, you know, to everybody was uh, the pandemic really kicked off at around March break. Um, and so everybody thought they were just going on an extended March break, and then it extended and it extended. And so if everybody thinks back to when they were a teenager, we all know what was the first thing they missed. They missed their friends, right? All of a sudden they weren't in school, they didn't see their friends, and that certainly had an impact on people. The other thing that was going on at that time was that... Um, you know, it's just after people have heard, we've begun now to hear people in our program, hearing about what college programs that they got into, this sort of thing. And so what happened was that a lot of people were wondering, well, what happens now with college? I've still got months of the year left to go. What if I don't finish? What if I can't finish? And so I re always remember uh, at that time, uh, you know, universities and colleges rushed to say to people, we'll, don't worry, we'll refund your money. But it was a little bit like saying to them, look, we'll refund your life. And a lot of people felt that way. Um, I think the other thing that people really lost out on. So again, if you think back to when you were a teen yourself, um, teens do things by experimenting. Not always the best plan, but nonetheless, they like to try things out. They like to talk about them with their friends. They like to think about the best way to do things uh, you know, some of the crazy ideas that they have, they don't really want to think about them with their mom and dad. They'd rather think about with them, their friends. And they lost out on that natural period when they're a little bit wild, and that's a normal thing. Uh, and uh, when, you know, and they lost out on that period of development when they really experiment, build friendships, and really develop an idea of who they're going to be. So all of those things had an impact. I think they're still having an impact. And I think that the thing that we forget is that even though we've adjusted, there are st there's still a lot of infectious disease around. And uh, there are other worries, right? There are worries around uh, international conflicts. There are worries, if you think about last year when there were all those forest fires and or contrast between 150 centimeters of snow in Halifax or in Sydney, to floods in other parts of the world. And there are a lot of things that people have on their mind and those are having an impact too. Yeah, I know it, it, it's a really good point because I, you talk to young people and, and those fears are real, right? Climate change, the economy, the job market, everything's different for them than it was for us, right? When we were in our uh, 20s and in our teens, the economy, the landscape, everything, everything was different. Everything was so different. And, um, and, and you know, actually I, I wanna ask you about this because when, I'll go back to my high school days and I'll be real upfront with you here, Dr. Beck. I think I didn't, I dropped, I did biology 11, but I didn't do biology in grade 12. Okay. So I'm being upfront with you here. And the reason why I'm being upfront is because I do have a kind of a biology related question for you, which is about this age group. And I know that this is something that there's actually some underlying physiological reasons why teenagers, and, and it is, it's very much like a high school biology class, but could you maybe explain to us why youth and people at that age are particularly vulnerable to mental health stuff at that at that juncture of, of, of their life? So in the developing brain in adolescence, and I think the other important thing is that we know that this brain development can continue through to a person's mid-20s. 
two things are happening. The first thing is that some is that uh, fatty tissue is wrapping itself around the nerves, a myelin sheath, and that develops in adolescence. And until that develops, it's uh, you know all of a person's reasoning and the connections between different parts of their brains are not as strong as they need to be. The other thing that develops throughout adolescence in the brain is the what's called the area called the prefrontal cortex, and that's the part of your brain that's right behind here, and uh, again, connections in that part of your brain grow. And it is the development of the myelin sheath as well as the prefrontal cortex that assists in uh, problem solving, in executive functioning. So everybody is aware of, especially um, uh, adolescent males making some not good decisions necessarily. And a lot of that has to do with their executive functioning, just hasn't developed all of the problem solving skills that they'll have about 10 years later in some cases. Um, sometimes there's, Dr. Beck, there's stigmas around starting conversations, right? With your teen or your young adult about mental health, that, 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 you know, it, you're not sure how to start the conversation and parents don't know how to do it or adults who are in their lives don't know how to do it. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that, um, about, you know, being a parent and having kids and how do you start those conversations? Like, how do you, uh, are there some simple tips you can give our viewers today that are parents, coaches, teachers about supporting those kind of those young minds with mental health and, um, and encouraging them to have those conversations in a, in a healthy way? I think my colleagues from social work are going to call to follow me will maybe a little bit more elegant about it. But I, what I always tell people is just say it. And I say, just say it and, uh, and, uh, and make sure you have time to follow through because in the long run, uh, the way you have to think about it is let's take suicide. So if you're worried about suicide and your child thinking about suicide, just ask them in the best possible way you can and just communicate to them your love and how you're worried about this. And, and say, you know, I'm not doing this to hurt you. I'm not doing this to be nosy. I'm doing this because I love you and I'm worried sick. And it doesn't matter how elegant you are. You just need to get the words out there, communicate your worry and how much you care. And what I say to parents is, uh, just I say to them, just go ahead. Because I think that the parents that I've seen who regret things the most are the ones who say, you know, I was thinking of asking and I didn't. So you'd much rather be in the position of asking those questions badly than not having asked them at all. And we know that, I think the other thing that parents really underestimate is their influence. The, there is research that shows that the opinion that, thou, that, that most adolescents value and that they pay attention to, even if they say they don't value it, is actually their parents' opinion. Uh, so I think that that's in, important to remember. And, in that uh, you love them and they love you. Yeah, it, it's a really good way of putting it, right? Because that's the age group where we as parents and teachers and coaches, that's where we kind of butt heads with them the most, right? And so to think that they really value our opinion, but they don't know how to express it, right? That's that's an important message to to pass along. Um, you know, you know, speaking of those, that, that kind of the teenagers, uh, Dr. Beck, I want to ask you about the incentives for maybe uh, getting an early teen to go get mental health services versus relying on just hey I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to my friends or my peers. I think that um, uh, I think that it's important to I mean a lot of kids understand the idea of people who know things better than others, and I think the other thing we're doing in in uh, is that we're more and more helping teachers and other professionals to know how to have conversations with children. And I think that that uh, what's important is to emphasize to children that your friend may not know what to do if you're in difficulty and that uh, you'll do anything you can to support them in this process. One of the blogs that I wrote was about how to support your child in therapy. And I think that some of the elements around that, including uh, being open to therapy yourself. Uh, make sure, uh, you know, make sure that if you hear, you know, you will hear and your children will hear other people saying, oh, you don't need a therapist. You just need to talk to a friend. 
I think that it's important to emphasize the skill of therapists and the expertise of therapists and make a distinction between someone with professional credentials and training and someone who's a friend. And not that friends don't care, but if there's a real problem or something difficult that somebody has to deal with, your friends aren't going to have the education to deal with it or and they won't necessarily know what to do. And you wouldn't want to leave them in that position. Uh, a final question for you here, Dr. Beck, and this is something that I have heard echoed by multiple uh, parents, fellow parents who have said, you know, I, I would love to give my child an opportunity to see a therapist, to see somebody, a social worker, anybody to talk to, system's clogged. Uh, there's no room. The system is overtaxed. It's overburdened. So um, given the current landscape and the challenges, Dr. Beck, that are, that are obviously there, um, how can parents get help for their kids right now? So I think uh, we do have a resource for children in Ottawa. It has lots of ideas beyond uh, beyond psychiatry, beyond the, the various mental health programs. And that is the one call, one click uh, resource in the city. I, you know, in years gone by, I've said, make sure you get in touch with your family doctor. Because family doctors we know are doing probably a third of the mental health work in the system. But, you know, so many people in Ottawa in particular right now don't have a family physician that it's uh, important to have other resources. And the other resource I'd recommend is that the one call, one click system does provide information to people. And you can speak to the people at one call, one click or go online and um, they can refer you to the right resource, including if it's necessary to uh, a mental health services at CHEO or at the Royal. Uh, and that's the that that's another good way to get access. So those would be my that would be my thought. Yeah, no, those are excellent excellent resources and tips. And Dr. Beck, thank you for uh, for kicking off our conversation here on this evening. I know you're not really going far because you're going to stick around at the end. We're going to have a kind of a panel discussion with everybody. So thanks so much for giving your time and your insight here. And we'll 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 get you back on here in a few minutes. Thank you. There goes Dr. Gail Beck. So uh, eloquent. Although she said that she wasn't eloquent, she actually said that our next two guests, Sarah Stewart, Rob Nettleton, would be even more eloquent than, than Dr. Beck was when it came to this particular topic. So we want to bring in Sarah Stewart and Rob Nettleton. Uh, they're both social workers at uh, the Royals Youth Psychiatry Program. Uh, in their clinical work, uh, Rob and Sarah spent a lot of time helping youth navigate the challenges associated with mental illness and uh, as well as supporting families. So Sarah and Rob are going to drop by here to share some practical tips some advice for parents and caregivers, Sarah and Rob. Welcome to the show. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. Hi, Ian. Hey, nice to see you. Yeah, listen. I I think the first question that I think a lot of parents have, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go with the teenage age group here. And and Sarah, maybe I'll start with you because look, I, I'll be honest. I'll be very transparent. I have a night uh, my uh, wife and I have a 19 year old and a 16 year old. When you have teenagers, sometimes you butt heads with them, right? And sometimes you have disagreements, and that's Normal teenager stuff. But the question becomes, how do we discern, Sarah, between normal teenage stuff and, ooh, you know what? I think something's wrong. What What are some of the things we should be looking for as parents of teens? Yeah, good question. And, and normal is a wide swath. So it's normal to be moody and it's also normal not to be moody. Um, some people feel anxiety naturally a little bit more intensely than others, and that's all normal and to be expected. Um, I think as professionals, we get concerned when we see mental health impacting somebody's function. So if somebody's having a really hard time going to school consistently, you know, it's just not just the one off or a bad week on the heels of, you know, some stress. Um, if somebody's having a really hard time socializing and they really want to be able to make friends and don't know how and are spending a lot of time at home um, on their own, that would be another time that we could consider reaching out. Um I would say um, trusting your gut is really important. You know, um, it's normal to maybe even think about not wanting to be alive and to need to need a break. It's not normal to think about planning your death 
And that's another time when we would get really concerned. Um, I think that parents, there's a myth out there for parents that uh, if I ask, it's going to trigger something. Um, right. and, and and it's not true. It just, it, it helps people to feel uh, cared for. So I would encourage parents to trust their gut. If they're noticing a difference in function, if they're noticing um, a behavior change, that would be a good time to uh, to ask some questions about how, how their loved one's doing. Yeah, and Rob, I think, um, you know, just to sort of piggyback off of that, I think it's important, right, to say, as Sarah mentioned, just because you pull your child aside at the dinner table or, you know, wherever you do it and have the conversation in the car, doesn't mean now, now you're planting a seed, right? Or now you're, 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 you know, I think that that part of it is important. So how do you, how would you give some advice, Rob? How would you give advice for parents about having that serious conversation about mental health with their child? So it, it's, it, it's a tough question. I think it, it, it comes down to a lot, a lot of context, but I think the first thing I would say is to not necessarily panic. Like I think at this point, if you've sort of seen some of the things that Sarah has sort of identified, you know, you're seeing maybe changes in, in, in behaviors or maybe pulling away from things that, you know, maybe they were of interest in before, like these are some cause for concern, but this is not an opportunity for you to panic, right? So it's important to kind of maintain that stance of, you know, an attitude of, of kind of curiosity and and and, and caring and resist that innate sort of carrier parental urge of diving immediately into problem solving mode. Um, because at that age, teenagers, 16, 17, 18 years, years old, um, they're dealing with a lot of problems and their problems become or can become very complex. They become complex emotional problems, complex social problems, many of which there's not a lot of solutions that could be sort of readily available, right? So resist that urge to jump into problem solving mode that this is something that I can handle, right? So I think adopting that attitude of like curiosity, caring, um, and starting that conversation gently with, um, you know, you know, uh, like, hey, how are you feeling today? Or it's okay to kind of name something. Like if you see that your son or daughter is, um, maybe they're, they're a bit more lethargic lately. They're kind of downcast. Maybe they're saying some things that don't necessarily sound like them. They don't have the same energy as normal. It's okay to sort of say, hey, you know, over the past uh, past couple of hours, I've or past, co past couple of days, I've noticed you seem a bit down. I, I wonder if you're sad, or I wonder if you're feeling really anxious about that test. Um, it's okay to sort of name those emotions and put that out there. This also can help give your youth a vocabulary in which to describe their own experiences, um, if that's actually how they're feeling. But if you throw that out there, you kind of throw them a ball, like, hey, I wonder if you're feeling sad, or I wonder if you're feeling really anxious with everything going on at school. If you're wrong, chances are they're going to tell you that you're wrong, right? And so that's good. That gives you some information to go off of. Um, but it also, again, can start that conversation um, and, and build that connection, which is so important when we want to have these bigger conversations about, about suicide or getting or getting support or more intensive supports like therapy or things like that. Um, is there a good time of day to have like just, and again, these are general questions, right? But is it better to, you know, some, some people still have the ability to, you know, say good night to their child and not tuck them in when they're this age, but you know what I mean? You, you say, is it good to do it at that time? Breakfast table, dinner table, like driving somewhere, like, is there any ideal time or place for these conversations? Oh, wow. Um, hmm. That's a good, <laughs> you know what? I think, I think, I think time and place, you know, matter a lot. I mean, I, I guess it really depends on on sort of what it is that you're dealing with, right? Like maybe when the when, maybe when your son or daughter sort of slam in the door in your face is not now is not the time to sort of talk about problem solving again because again, like their their emotions are probably heightened, very activated, and at that point when they're when they're thinking primarily with their emotions and acting with their emotions, they're not going to be there or in a place where they can hear and have these kind of logical, more rational conversations about about mental health. So I think when it comes to time and place, I think it's okay to kind of ask for when that time and place is uh, is best for them. And so what I mean by that is taking opportunities when things are actually going well for your son or daughter um, and finding out um, from them, like, hey, um, you know, when things aren't going so well, when is the best time for us to have this kind of conversation? Is it right when you come in the door? Do you need some space um, or, um, or or whatever? And kind of work that kind of plan out in advance. Um, this is particularly important if you have someone, if you if you if your youth has periods where they might have uh, mental health crises or different episodes of depression or low mood to sort of use those times when things are going really well um, to plan around that and how to have those conversations. 
if you try, you shoot your shot, you know, um, and it doesn't land. Um, I think it's important that, um, you know, you let them know that you're there, right? And even if you're not able to tell them what you want to say or work on a problem or solutions that you're hoping to, to resolve, that you let them be aware of your presence, you know, that, hey, now may not be the right time to talk. I understand it's been a really difficult day for you. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on in school right now. I know exams just ended. There's a lot of stress. So how about this? How about I check in on you in 20 minutes? Um, and then see if you're ready to talk then um, and, 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 and go from there, right? But the important thing is actually come back in 20 minutes and check. They still, they still may not be ready to have the conversation then, um, but you're kind of following up on that commitment while also communicating your understanding and bridging that connection, which is so important for them at that age is to feel understood. You know, one of the things I love about doing these sessions is when you're doing a live show like we are here, um, you have the ability to get live questions coming in from, from our, mm -hmm. our audience. And so we do have one here that's been added in uh, from somebody. And maybe, Sarah, I'll throw this one over to you. Um, how do you encourage a young adult to seek continuous or ongoing therapy when they claim it is not necessary? So how do you, how do you encourage a teen or a young adult to go on and take therapy and, and go through therapy sessions when they think, nah, I don't need this? Yeah, uh, it's a it's a hard thing, I think, to see, especially as a parent, when you're watching your your loved one uh, suffer in your experience, you know, um, and it's kind of something that we might just have to accept, like we don't have the ability to force our kids into therapy. Um, and if they're resistant for it, uh, it's something to explore. Um, so I would I would probably just be curious again, like as Rob was speaking um, before about sort of like that spirit of curiosity. It's like, what went well when you were in therapy and what didn't go well? And, you know, what do you think the benefit might be versus uh, of engaging versus not? And that could potentially encourage some motivation. Um, and also modeling, you know, and this is speaking to sort of what Kale was talking about earlier about being willing to engage in therapy yourself and really, um, you know, set an example of what self-care looks like and, and hopefully we'll pull our loved ones along. Yeah, that you know what that's a great uh, a great thing for parents, and we're going to talk about coaches and teachers in a second. But that modeling behavior, right? Like, if, if you want to show what healthy behavior looks like, or get your child or young one, it's the best to, to try and set the example, right? And that includes things like how much time you're on your phone, and what time you go to bed, and so, you know what you're eating, and and if you're able to to be healthy, and all those things. And and you're right, it's it's about trying to model healthy, healthy behavior. Um, I'd like to know about, uh, and this is, a this is a tough conversation to have, and this is about substance use and drugs. And um, that's a really hard conversation that to have with your own child, with any child, with anybody, it doesn't even matter what the age to, to sit down with somebody and say, you know, I think, I think you have a problem with the substance. It's, uh, it can come across as accusatory. It can come across as, you know, very invasive and, and arresting for that person to feel like uh, they're being cornered. So how do we deal with this as parents? Let's And, uh, you know, maybe you have a, a young person in your life who is using drugs or a substance and they don't think they have a problem, but you think they have a problem with it. And 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 how do you deal with that fallout? What what's What's the way to handle that? Yeah, I think with substance use, shame is really, um, really sort of steeped in shame. So you really want to be um, at, at this point when somebody's becoming, you know, almost becoming an adult, they have a lot of autonomy still and they're allowed to make some bad choices, choices that we might not disagree, we might disagree with. And so you really want to be careful about shaming and shutting down conversations. We want to be people that our, our kids can come to. Um, and what I would be, you know, my instinct would be to notice and reflect like, oh, I see this is, this is happening. Like you're having trouble getting up and you're getting in fights and you're feeling really short and you seem to be like fixated on going out. Like, do you think there's a, do you think that there's any consequences and, and not being afraid to sort of like dig into it? People will often dismiss consequences pretty quickly, but to really sort of like ex take time to explore can develop a little bit of discrepancy for people when they're like, oh yeah, maybe actually it's not as helpful as I thought it might be. 
Yeah, Sarah's brought up a really good point. I kind of want to build upon it, this idea of like discrepancies, right? It's sort of highlighting how the behaviors that they're engaging in, substance use or whatever, are sort of coming into conflict with maybe what's important to them or the things that are important to them in their life. And that's not the things that are important to us, but the things that are important to your youth, right? So when that behavior might be coming into conflict with or getting in the way of them enjoying that sort of thing. The other thing that I always like to emphasize when it comes to substance use, especially when... Uh, especially if this is like your, this is your, your teen, this is your youth, that's really important to understand is um, A, to not take it personal and B, remember that they're doing this for a reason and the reason is usually because it works. And what I mean by that is it's helping them in some way. Um, it's helping them cope with big feelings in some way. It's helping them cope with anxiety in some way. It's helping them cope with stress in some way. And what we want to avoid doing is placing an expectation on them that you have to stop that behavior outright and not add anything else to help them cope, right? So that's the thing that we want to keep in mind around um, being gentle, being um, non-judgmental about substance use and not engaging in that shame that Sarah was speaking about is that they're not, they're doing this because it helps them solve a problem, right? And that could be a problem of fitting in or a problem with big feelings. So we can't take something away that's helping them feel good or feel better or fit in without offering something else or helping them learn something else so they can get the same result and, you know, or close to it. Yeah, and, and I think what, what Sarah mentioned too about, you know, the shame element, and it's just important, the way that you phrase it, right? And, and same with you, Rob, is that they're doing this for, potentially doing it for a reason, right? And, and if you can get to the core of that and have a, uh, healthy conversation that's not accusatory or, uh, you know, filled with, with with tension and anger, you might have a better chance. So that's, it's really important that you're, you're, you're passing along uh, those messages. And of course, you know what, it's not just parents, right? It's, and I mentioned earlier, one of the, the cool things for me is I get to coach my daughter in ringette and I get to teach at Carleton University, which are two, like, it's such a privilege, you know, that it's, it's a real privilege to be in charge of young people in, in, in any capacity to have them under your care, it's just an honor and it's a privilege, uh, but it comes with responsibilities. And I, I wonder for anybody that uh, is watching us tonight here, uh, Rob and Sarah, that, that might fall into that bucket of a coach or a teacher. Um, what kind of avenues do we have in that realm to maybe get to young people to open up a conversation with them? Because you know what, to be honest, Sometimes I do feel like with, with my students in particular at Carleton, I feel like I have a really good relationship with them because I'm not emotionally attached to them. You know what I mean? It's a professional relationship. And I wonder what could we be doing as coaches and teachers to open up some avenues to maybe get young people to talk to us in, in those spaces? I love this question. I think that it's coaches and teachers that can save lives. And it's not necessarily by directly intervening, just uh, make making a connection and making somebody feel special, like just a little bit special could actually uh, influence somebody pretty dramatically. And, you know, we're living in a culture that's very risk averse and it can really discourage people um, in place in positions of authority um, from showing uh, from showing an interest, you know, taking an interest or asking questions. And I would just um, encourage people to not let their anxiety stop you. If I have an urge to ask somebody how they are and to take a little bit of an extra interest, there's a reason. And it's probably really important. Um, it's these days more than ever that we really need a village. Um, and, uh, and please, yeah, follow your gut. Yeah, I think that's really a really good, um, a really good perspective. And as well, thinking into something we've talked about before on the opportunity sort of modeling conversations around mental health and I mean I, I can speak being 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 a guy now granted in high school I wasn't necessarily on the football or the soccer teams or whatnot but I was I was in those locker rooms um mostly just changing um <laughs> uh, and you know I think it's an opportunity for like coaches I think specifically especially when we're thinking of like young boys or whatnot to use opportunities to have serious conversations around mental health in the same way that you would talk about physical injuries or physical strain um that kind of thing to sort of dispel these gender stereotypes around conversations I work so much with with young boys in uh, in my practice in the royal um and so many of them default to anger as the only feeling that they have because they feel like that's the only emotion that they're allowed to express without having to deal with shame or being 
labeled in some way um, as not being man masculine enough. And I think it's important to normalize that just because you're a boy, just because you're a male does not mean that you're not going for the full emotion wheel of emotions, just like the rest of us, right? Just happens that it shows up more often or not than with men. Um, so I think for coaches is really about normalizing and helping to dispel some stereotypes around um, different tropes and myths around uh, uh, and long held beliefs around masculinity and, and, and emotions. Um, and also like, I think, don't underestimate, you know, your role as a teacher or as a guidance counselor. Again, I've been doing this work now for a long time and the youth I work with, they sing high praise of their teachers. They have their favorite teachers. They have their favorite guidance counselor. They think their coach is the best person in the whole wide world. So don't underestimate um, who, who these youth are more likely to share their story with or give that invitation to have that conversation. So to build on to Sarah's point, just, just ask, um, check in, how are you, how are you doing, you know? Um, and don't be afraid to do that. You know, I, I think Rob, you, you hit on something really important there with young men and boys in particular about, you know, we, we, we don't give them enough tools in their toolbox, right? It, it's like we tell them, you can't cry and you can't show emotion and you can't show empathy. And that's why I was really happy. Uh, we've had Mark Borowiecki, who's played for the Ottawa Senators. We've had Mark come on some of these uh, these sessions with the Royal. And I think he's such a great example of, you know, as a, as a, as an athlete, as a man, as, as you know, however you want to look at it, you can be physical and aggressive, but also empathetic. Like it, you don't have to choose. Uh, we have to, we have to really encourage young men to understand it's not an either or it's both. And it's really good. It's you, you can be empathetic and physical. You can be compassionate and, you know, aggressive and all these things uh, that, 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 that make people who they are. And I, I don't think we've done a good enough job. So it's, it's really refreshing to, to hear you say that. And, and one thing I also want to ask you about is, you know, Sometimes I hear people and look, I'm in my 40s, okay? And sometimes I hear people in my age demographic, whether they're parents or not, maybe they're coaches or teachers, and they're like, ah, young people today, they have it so easy. They're so lazy, young people today, right? And it's like a blanket statement that young people today, they don't know how good they have it. Young people today don't, you know, insert here. I want to take a moment to talk about how when you make a comment like that, how it lands for a young person and how damaging that can be. Because if you're trying to build up a relationship mm -hmm. and empathy, if you start with, you don't know how easy you have it, you're not going to go anywhere. Are you Sarah? Well, I have two words for you, social media. Yeah. <laughs> and I am really glad that my high school experience is a rumor at this point. Yeah. <laughs> Right, uh, And of course, it just makes people feel dismissed. And what we're doing, we're trying to do is make space for people to feel important and uh, and that their experience matters. So you might have the urge in that moment. And that's a time that we can practice self-regulation and take a breath. <laughs> yeah. And I'd like to kind of like pick up on that and just think about how um, your experience may have been one thing. My experience may have been one thing, but it's completely different these days. And um, not only with, with with social media, but there's just so many different kinds of pressure on youth today that there weren't before. And we may be experiencing a lot of similar problems around bullying, but how it's done is differently, right? Um, uh, like how, how it's done uh, online is differently, how it's done in such really horrific ways um, it is so different than what it was today. And I think whether or not you agree um, with um, youth today having it easier than when you had it, it doesn't really matter because we don't need to agree to understand and respect someone's experience. We also don't need to agree in order to validate someone's feelings, right? So whether or not your time was harder or their time was harder, you can connect to that feeling of whatever that feeling was that you're connecting with. If it's that sadness, if it's that worry, if it's anxiety, if it's fear about the future, you can connect to that and that's going to help you connect with your youth, even though your circumstances are different, right? Um, so I want to kind of emphasize that we don't need to agree. We don't need to have all the same. Um, we don't have, need to have at least sort of that equal sense of uh, awful high school experience across the board, you know, and like uh, to, have, to be able to connect on a feelings level. And I think that's where uh, sometimes I see with parents, they get lost because they fall into wanting to use like logic to correct all the time, you know, um, and, and, and focusing too much on their own experience and forgetting, um, what that real experience is right now for, for their youth. Right. You know, so focus Rob, on you used, a, used a really good word that I just want to pull out from there. Mm -hmm. 
and it's validate. Yeah. It validate. And that's really at the, the crux of what both of you have tried to share mm -hmm. with our uh, audience tonight is the importance of validating youth, right? It's it's about validation and validation isn't just, it's it's listening, isn't it? It's it's understanding, it's listening. But I, if there's anything I want our, our as we wrap up this conversation, if there's anything I want our, our audience to take away, mm -hmm. I would like them to think about how they can validate the young person in their life, right? And that that will just lead to to good conversations down the road. Yeah, it's a really good point. And I think in order to properly validate or express empathy to someone, you have to be able to connect to a feeling within yourself where you've been there before, right? Regardless of whether or not the circumstances are the same. And, and validation isn't just about, you know, yeah, I feel sad, but, um, you know, you still got to go. Um, try to remove but from your vocabulary, right, as much as you can. Um, that There's that expression, I like to say, anything that comes uh, after a but doesn't count, it's, <laughs> or anything that comes before a but doesn't count. Um, and when it comes with validation, you want to kind of prove and show them that you get it, right? Like, it, it makes sense that things are really hard for you right now. And here's why I think it is hard for you right now. Um, and again, that's where you're avoiding getting into that jumping that problem solving and just sitting with those feelings, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, before I let you both go, I, I just want to ask, give you both an opportunity. Um, I think what you do is really important. I'm sure it must be really difficult at times and, and like simultaneously rewarding and difficult, right? Like the, the work that you do. Can I just ask you, and I'm going completely like, and this is how you know it's a live show. I'm going completely off script here, but I'm I'm just genuinely curious about how you approach your jobs and how like how difficult it is to to do this type of work and how do you um how do you leave your your job at your job? How do you leave your work at work and not take it with you? Because I think you do very uh important work. It can be exhausting work. And I'm just very curious. I'm gonna start with you, Sarah. I'm gonna put you on the hot seat. Uh, when you do the type of work that you do and you're a social worker and you work with young people, it must be so rewarding, but it must be so difficult. How do you, how do you handle that on a personal level? I'm just yeah. curious. I'm, I mean, I think Rob will agree with me when I say we probably have the best job ever. Um, we get to work with dynamic, bright, hilarious, um, engaging young people every day who teach us. Um, and we most, for the most part, we get to watch them get better. Um, so they give me just as much as I give them. Absolutely. Um, and of course we have our days and we have to take a mental health day ourselves and decompress. And we talk to each other all the time too. We have really, uh, strong relationships and that's, you know, so we carry each other along as well, but I, every day we leave work, I leave work and am grateful for my job. You know, I, 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 you know, I definitely co-sign everything Sarah's saying, um, and I'll be honest with you, Ian, um, and Sarah has heard this, there have been many, many sleepless nights I've had worrying about some of the youth I have on my caseload um, if, since I've been doing this. It's, it is hard. It is the best job in the whole world, but I do, yeah, it, it, sometimes it comes home with you because sometimes it's impossible for it not to. Um, and at the same time, having those connections with each other, um, forging really strong relationships with your peers, you know, engaging with other people who do this kind of work yourself, and also more importantly, doing your own work. We talked about therapy, getting family members uh, to get therapy, getting our youth to get therapy. Well, therapists get therapy too, um, because I don't know about you, Ian, but for me, I've heard my own high school experience told to me several different ways by several different teenage boys over the past right. few years. And it's impressive how many times I'm like, oh, there's a ping in the back of my mind. I'm like, oh, I'm going to have to talk to my therapist about that because that memory has just resurfaced. Um, so it's important to take care of ourselves too, because we do do really, really hard stuff. And uh, I love what I do, but it's hard. Yeah. And you know what, for both of you, um, the passion for what you do just came shining through tonight. You could see in the way that you answered the questions, especially my last question, which was completely off, uh, off the script, you could just see the passion uh, and the genuine care that you have for this uh, for this line of work. So I, I want to thank you for sharing your experiences, your time. And we're not actually putting you away for the night because you're going to sneak back in here in a few minutes and be part of our panel. But thank you, both of you, Rob and Sarah, for, for helping lead such a, a you know a thoughtful and dynamic conversation here tonight. Thank you.
All right. Um, time for us to move along to our next guest. I told you we would have four guests uh, on this evening and uh, uh, we're, we've just gone through three and it's time now to shift our focus a little bit and learn about some research that is driving some brand new understanding uh, when it comes to psychology and biology. And, and now I'm really regretting. I told Dr. Beck earlier, I, did, I, I dropped biology after grade 11. So this is... Uh, this isn't great for me, but Dr. Zach Kamensky can hopefully uh, help me out here because his research, uh, kind of looking at the, the connection between psychology and biology and how it can help us better understand suicide risk. And Dr. Kaminsky is a molecular bio, uh, biologist specializing in epigenetics. So I'm thinking he went right through grade 12 and maybe a little bit higher in uh, in biology. But uh, Dr. Kaminsky uh, uh, is in 2014, he and his colleagues at uh, John Hopkins published a study that connected the dots between the changes affecting particular genes and increased suicide risk. And so this increased uh, marker sort of uh, looked at, sorry, now I'm just, you know what, my computer froze on me here and my script has just disappeared. Hold on, there we go. It's back. I just made up stuff to, to, to hold along. Uh, Dr. Kaminsky's uh, work generated uh, some of the first epigenetic biomarkers in psychiatry. So this is, uh, this is great to have uh, Dr. Kaminsky, who's now at the Royal. He's working to better understand the biological connections between biology and suicide risk with the goal of one day creating a blood test that can help identify those who are at a higher risk of suicide. So that was a long way for me to get to here. Uh, Dr. Kaminsky, thank you so much for uh, for joining us here uh, this evening. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, and uh, uh, really, you know, I've heard a lot of things that I'm going to try to to wrap into um, uh, a talk this evening where I'm going to talk about uh, the biology and the psychology and sort of bring it back to some of the concepts that we've heard today. So I'm going to uh, do a screen share uh, and show a few slides. Uh, so please bear with me. Okay. Um, so uh, with that introduction, thank you very much. Um, let's get started. If there's one message I want you to take from tonight, it's really that suicide, what we're talking about, it's not all in the head, right? There is a biology to this um, and 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 a psychology. Uh, let's let's start with a psychology. What are the psychological theories of suicide? Let's level set and go back to 1897, where Durkheim came up with the first attempt to examine suicide in non-moralistic moralistic and judgmental ways. We heard about being non-judgmental and accepting things, and, um, and uh, so we're going to continue from there. Um, based on this, building on that, there were a number of other theories that effectively incorporated a number of themes. I'm going to sort of summarize them here. They involved lost relationships, perceived burdensomeness, uh, a hypersensitivity distress, ultimately coming with a tunnel vision uh, or a cognitive constriction. So these are really observations of, of what this suicidal state might feel like. But how did they get there? Right. Well, let's uh, look at uh, Linham's theory, uh, the emotional dysregulation theory, which was really the first biosocial theory to, to suggest that there's this underlying biological vulnerability, which meets a time of stress to, to promote risk. This is most akin to uh, what the biologists study, uh, the diaphysis stress model, which again, has times of, of distress and stress meeting this underlying vulnerability. Okay. So really to drive this point home, I want to make a, a, an analogy here with this brand new bicycle. This is a person, right? And this uh, new person has some resiliency characteristics in the form of uh, shock absorbers. Um, and then we have another completely brand new person here, but perhaps this person has some vulnerabilities. Um, and now we have the road to life. There are various life events. We may have bumps in the road, but these aren't too bad. School transitions, house moves, a bit of stress, but man, Manageable. Then there are other lives with tougher transitions, uh, relationship endings, etc. And when we put these together, it's not difficult to see how both bikes may be able to handle all situations, uh, uh, or uh, some of the situations, but when you have certain uh, resiliency characteristics missing and a difficult road, we could get the perfect storm, which leads to suicide risk. Okay, so that's really diathesis stress uh, and what we base our science on. And so what is this biology? What might this be? 
Well, we know that there are environmental risks to suicide, uh, such as losing a parent to suicide or having uh, early life abuse or trauma. This can lead a youth to grow up to have psychopathology of their own, including suicide. Right. And what's important is that all of these factors can actually reprogram the DNA on the epigenetic level. Now, epigenetics really just means chemical modifications written on top of the DNA that act like light switches to turn genes on and off. And our laboratory was able to find an epigenetic change in a gene that seems important for our stress response. I've been talking about stress and, and uh, dysregulation. So um, what is our stress system called? It's called the HPA axis. Now this looks a little bit complicated, but I'm gonna take you through it. Effectively, when our brains experience a stress in the amygdala, we effectively go through our stress response. We release glucocorticoids into the body, which give uh, our muscles power. Uh, glucose metabolism is increased and we can uh, fight off bears or even just go to that meeting at 9 a.m. or cross the street. We need stress. It's normal. And when that stress is over, the glucocorticoids bind molecularly to their stress hormone receptors, and they actually shut off the stress response in the normal uh, situations. Now, we found an epigenetic change, which was replicated by a number of other studies, suggesting that what we found might actually be real. It was in this gene called SCA2, and it was predictive of uh, risk to suicidal thought as well as suicide attempts. And it was found in the, the brains of people who had died by suicide. Um, and so what does this SCA2 do? Well, I'll give you a hint. It's related to the stress response. So it's going to be a bad day. We've got School may be a tough day at work or even more intense situations. Our stress system is going to be activated. Glucocorticoids flood the system. And then when the stress is over, they bind the GR, glucocorticoid receptor, and the gene, SCA2, that we found helps bring this into the cell where it activates the negative feedback. This, in turn, gets rid of the stress response and everything is copacetic. However, with this epigenetic change, there's actually less SCA2. And so this means that there's actually less negative feedback. And this means that there's a failure to shut down the stress when a time of stress is experienced. We can't shut it off. And actually, this can actually change um, the brain connectivity patterns that we see. So uh, when we have the normal uh, biological resilience, a time of stress is blocked by the prefrontal cortex. This was the area that Dr. Beck was talking about but with less epigenetic uh, a modification in these genes, we actually have less activity in these regions. When we have stress, we've got an underactivity of the cortex involving uh, decision-making, impulse control, inhibition of negative thoughts, while the fear center of the brain, the amygdala, is overactive. And it's not difficult to imagine sort of intuitively how this uh, circuitry could lead to some of those uh, psychological theory uh, manifestations tunnel vision, lower control over our anger or impulses that uh, might lead to suicide. So why are our genes doing this to us, right? Why is this system like this? And the answer is probably uh, to be found in evolutionary biology. So uh, back in the day when, uh, as I understand history, cavemen were being chased by dinosaurs, um, we can't always, uh, uh, if I've got it right, maybe I also missed uh, 12th grade biology. Um, there are, uh, uh, we can't watch our kids all the time, right? And so they're going to go off and go to the watering hole. And perhaps this non-anxious uh, child is, is says it's going to be fine. But the anxious child is going to think, oh, I better be careful. And they survive to pass on the genes. Because the genes don't care when they're evolving if we develop mental illness. They only care that you live long enough to pass on the genes. That's what you know, evolutionist. And so in fact, there may be uh, an evolutionary biology to suicide as well, um, where it's suggested that if, uh, if someone is sort of uh, left a family unit or a tribe and they consider themselves a burden, um, this is involved in the psychological theories of suicide, but the genes may have evolved a way of understanding that they're threatening the same genes in the family. And so have evolved a method to sort of eliminate or take out that uh, sort of burdensome elements so that the whole family doesn't um, uh, not thrive. 
So anyway, it's an interesting thought. But effectively, this is diathesis stress, where without the underlying vulnerability, you could be resilient in times of stress, but with it, you know, you can lead uh, to suicide risk. So now knowing what we know about the biology of suicide, can we understand the WHO's risk factors? And so you can see that there are some uh, stressful life events that we see, but there are also some that may be indicative of this underlying vulnerability. Okay, so what can we do? Well, we've heard about facilitating connection. Also, uh, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, can reverse some of the epigenetic marks involved in stress response uh, systems. And also, I want to share with you a bit of unpublished research uh, showing that connection is key. So to do this, I need to tell you very briefly, we have an artificial intelligence that guesses its suicide risk using social media, okay? So um, if you just take my word for that, basically the important point for this talk is that by running our models over someone's uh, social media timeline, we can get an indication of when someone is getting worse or better in terms of suicidal thought. And so this gives us a tool to monitor what contributes to people getting better or worse. So what we did was we looked at people uh, on Twitter who were tweeting about suicide, but we also looked at the people who responded to them. We found something really interesting. And that is, a, so this red arrow is when people tweet about suicide. And the red line are those people who didn't have any responses to them. They were alone. And the people who got better very uh, significantly were those with responses. So again, this is intuitive that asking and reaching out and connection matters. So we need to talk to our people. And we've heard a bit about this, but I've got it up here on a slide. How do we know when? Well, things you might see when someone's in distress, so they might be giving away possessions, they might have loss of interest in hobbies, reckless behavior, um, loss of interest in appearance or sex. Uh, you might hear things like, I just can't take it anymore. I won't be needing these things anymore. Uh, people giving things away. These are you know, invitations that should really prompt you to if you're thinking about whether or not to ask uh, about suicide, just ask. Um, we heard this before, um, that it's a myth that asking about suicide puts the idea into someone's head. And in fact, uh, you're opening up lines of conversation that can lower anxiety and reduce risk. And 75% of people who die by suicide indicate their intentions prior. So um, we also heard a little bit about how to connect uh, with resources. Dr. Beck mentioned one call, one click uh, for youth. There's also access MHA for adults and services like uh, Counseling Connect. Um, and uh, just very, very briefly, I wanna mention that uh, we have a, a new research called the Youth Nominated Support Team Program uh, uh, that Suicide Prevention Ottawa in partnership with the Royal is putting forth where youth discharged from inpatient stays with uh, suicidality actually uh, are uh, brought through a process to facilitate connections. So we heard uh, from Sarah that you know coaches and teachers save lives. Well, what these uh, 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 this intervention does is really get the youth to think about those uh, coaches, teachers, uh, mentors in their lives, and really facilitates connection with them over a period of twelve weeks. And uh, the intervention is is looking very promising. So uh, to end, really, what I wanted to say is that the factors contributing to suicidality stem from a combined influence of biology and the things that happen to us. The psychological theories of suicide can drive in part, uh, be driven by influences, and they can inform our interventions. Um, engaging with people in our lives and asking about suicide can reduce risk. And there are ways to get connected for yourself and others uh, to seek help for mental health concerns. So thank you all for your attention on my talk. Well. Amazing. Uh, Dr. Kaminsky, thanks so much. You know, I, I just want to ask you one other quick question here before we, uh, we're going to bring all the panelists back in. Uh, and that is, as I brought you in, uh, I, I know that you said that you, you know, looking at the connections between biology, suicide risk, and one day the ultimate goal of maybe creating a blood, something as simple as a blood test that could identify who's at a higher risk of, of suicide. I'm just, I'm so fascinated by that uh, because it feels like, wow, that would be such an easy um, way to maybe identify and get some preventative steps. So, I mean, how far away, that seems like such a far-fetched idea, but how far away would we be from, from something like that? Yeah, I mean, so um, it, it's a great question. Um, you know, what, some of the challenges when it comes to uh, predicting suicide risk is that, um, you know, so there are always going to be false positives. And with something like suicide, you know, uh, just guessing who might be at risk, you know, can be useful to a degree, but I think, 
you know, um, it would be really important to guess uh, who might be at risk really early on so that we can act at a time when uh, before someone's in a period of distress. Um, we are actually working on a different blood test that predicts risk to, to postpartum depression. Um, and we're doing that because we know when postpartum depression is going to happen. It's harder to predict suicide with a blood test because it's harder to do those studies where, um, uh, you know, you could you could take five years and study 100 people and not one of them would develop suicidal thought. And so it's difficult in, in today's um, scientific sphere to really uh, uh, drive those blood tests forward uh, in a productive way. So I think it's going to be a long, long time before we have a blood test for suicide. But there are promising digital methods that can guess at risk and allow us to try to... Uh, develop interventions to facilitate uh, connections, you know, it's not just who's at risk. Now it's solved. That's, you know, that's, that's not the way it's done. We need to think who might be at risk. And even if they're a false positive, what are we going to do? Well, maybe we'll facilitate connections with this information. And even if they're a false positive, no one minds getting, you know, closer with their friends. So that's okay. Right. So ways to sort of integrate all this knowledge about connection, all of this knowledge about what promotes suicide risk and what's protective, and really combine that into like a system with um, uh, with these tools. And maybe there's room for a blood test uh, in there as well. But, uh, you know, I sort of alluded to some of the factors that make it challenging. Um, it's really exciting. It, it continues to replicate. But when it comes to um, you know, can we use this in the clinic uh, for doctors? I think we're, you know, uh, a long way off. Well, it's, it's fascinating nonetheless. And I, I have to say that even your, um, just the, the, the little social media, uh, looking at Twitter and, and people tweeting about suicide, and that's fascinating and groundbreaking stuff that wouldn't have existed 10, 15, 20 years ago, right? So to be able to have that sort of real-time data, it's, it's fascinating uh, what you're doing. And thank you for, for, for sharing your thoughts, your insight, and that uh, very... Uh, captivating presentation. Uh, I love the little moving graphics too. With the, uh, it just it kept it all animated. It was uh, it was great. You had my attention for the uh, the entire thing. All right, uh, I was really looking forward to this, and this is a an opportunity for anybody who's watching us live to fire some questions to us. You have four experts here, in Doctor Beck and uh, and 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 and, um, and Rob, and we have Sarah, and we have Doctor Kaminsky, and we we, we you know. You have them at your disposal here. So if you have any questions, drop them into the chat. Um, I do want to stress, though, uh, you know, with, with these questions, we can't go into um, specific diagnosis for like a, a, an, an exact individual problem that you're facing. Um, this is more meant to be sort of broad strokes information for you. But um, by all means, ask away. We are happy to facilitate any questions here that you might have. In fact, we're going to start one. We we had some pre-submitted ones that we're we've got from from people who have attended, uh, but we've got the live chat open. So drop your questions in, and maybe this is a good one for Doctor Beck because I know that uh, Doctor Beck, you have specifically uh, written about how youth can handle when there's big world events, and we've talked about how you know the landscape now with climate change and you know the economy and all these things. Can be overwhelming. We have a question here from a, a viewer, Dr. Beck, who says, how do I address negative thoughts about society and the environment um, from my 23-year-old son? Well, uh, that's a really, it's, that is a really good question, and it is a very timely question. And um, it's interesting. I'm thinking about that for a, a talk that I'm giving. And um, Right now in colleges and universities across Canada, some of the things that they're thinking about in terms of education are creativity. And I think that uh, as dire as things seem, one of the things that uh, that a number of uh, um, researchers about creativity are looking at is the fact that even at other times when things have seemed extremely uh, dire, uh, there have been things that seem like miracles and that we have to rely on the idea that uh, change does happen. Change happens uh, in a positive way over time. One of the one of the psychologist philosophers who thinks about this is Steven Pinker. He wrote about how no matter what, uh, if we look over the last thousand years, the world has continued to develop. 
And uh, even though the situation with climate change uh, looks very bad, there are lots of people thinking about it. And it's and so just given that past trajectory, the idea that we won't be able to find even miracle solutions uh, is uh, we shouldn't discount that possibility of miracles. And um, uh, I'm working on uh, uh, on a, a presentation on change for the Canadian Psychiatric Association meeting, and it does look at some of the ways that and the mechanisms that you can use for change. And so I'm optimistic because they're you know because young people alive today are creative and they have at their disposal many of the tools that Dr. Kaminsky mentioned, and that will allow them to work and network in ways such as we've never seen before. So that makes me optimistic. Uh, we have some more questions here and, and maybe uh, Sarah, we're gonna direct this one to you. This one comes in from an at attendee tonight. Um, how can you reassure a young adult that the future is going to be okay or at least how to manage their anxieties? Yeah, I'm sorry. I hope I was starting, I thought I was going to type a reply and maybe I screwed things up, but I really love this question because um, it's what every parent wants to do. Every parent wants to protect their child and it's kind of, um, you know, that's what's intuitive, right? And it's uh, it sounds counterintuitive, uh, but one of the biggest thoughts, most can, most uh, influential thoughts we have is I can't cope. Um, that can really sort of grind us to a halt when we're managing anxiety. And so as a parent, I would encourage the parent just to, to turn into a coach um, and coach them through and remind them that they can cope and they've probably been through a lot worse um, and actually really revisit those moments when they've uh, when they have managed adversity. Uh, because I know the people that I work with, there's no shortage of that. They're they're really they're really quite skilled when you look at it. Um, but that that belief that I can't cope can be really uh, paralyzing. Yeah, no, no, that's uh, that that's well put, Sarah. I, you know, Rob, I'm going to throw a question here at you. Uh, again, this one's coming in live from our uh, our, our viewers here. Um, my son is going to start high school next year. He's had challenges with anxiety in the past, and I know big changes are stressful. Can I do anything now to help him prepare for the major life change that's coming up? Oh, and it, you know, it's, 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 it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough question. Um, and it, cause it is a major life change, right? And if they've already struggled with anxiety, there's always, there's already that sort of doubt in their mind about their ability to cope. And I think when we think about anxiety, it's important to kind of keep in mind that anxiety is sort of this overestimation of a threat while underestimating our ability to cope with it, right? Which is kind of building on what Sarah was saying. So overestimation of a threat, underestimation of our, our ability to cope with it. Um, and in terms of like what I might recommend or what I might suggest to help prepare for that kind of uh, situation is to, is, is to sort of support your son in sort of learning as much as he can about this process, about going to high school, visiting the school, touring around the school, um, and also kind of piggying back on what we were talking about before is really just again, validating the fear, right? Because whether or not um, this is something that is uh, creating enough anxiety that, you know, he might engage in like school refusal and not want to go. Um, it's also important to kind of normalize that this is, this is new. It's scary. And there's dynamics at play. There are things that there's new social circles that kind of emerge. There's new challenges that emerge and whatnot. So again, validating that it, it does make sense. It's normal. It's to have these sort of reservations, but then helping them get access to the information that they might need to help maybe manage some of those fears. Maybe the anxiety is tied more towards um, worrying about what the school looks like or what it's going to be like, that kind of thing. Actually go to the school, make a, pl make a plan to tour around in it, um, yeah. to expose yourself to it. Um, anxiety is often best addressed by exposure to the thing that we are most uh, distressed by. So I'm encouraging actually getting closer to that uh, distress, a uh, distressful thing going to school. Um, and uh, and yeah, that's what I would try to say is get close to it. Run towards the danger. Yeah, yeah. I know. I like that. That's, you know, that's a good, uh, a good phrase for uh, most of what we've, we've talked about tonight, right? Is, is don't, don't be standing on the sidelines, run towards it, run like it's okay, run towards it and and, and tackle it head on. That's a, that's a good message. Um, I'm not sure who this question would be best directed for. I'm going to read it out and, uh, you know, 
you can put your hand up and, and, and jump in. But uh, we have a question here from a, a viewer who's watching us live and wants to know, is cannabis substance disorder in youth difficult to stop? It's available everywhere now if you're over the age of 19. And I think that's very young. So, and we talked about this a little bit about uh, substance use and, um, you know, drugs and that type of thing. And so the question is really, is cannabis substance disorder difficult to stop in youth? So I'm going to take that one. It happens that uh, in about a year from now, uh, University of Toronto Press will publish a book I'm writing that it will be a parent's guide to marijuana. And so I've been thinking about this a fair amount. And um, uh, I think, first of all, if uh, you're worried about uh, a family member using too much marijuana, that it is important to get advice around that. Cannabis use disorder uh, you know, you can go through the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual and you read through it and you think, oh, this seems like, you know, it makes you feel as though anybody can diagnose it. But it's actually a fairly complex thing to do. And psychiatrists and psychologists struggle with this. Um, so I think that if you've got that suspicion at all, and if, you're, uh, if your family member will go and see someone to have a conversation about this, I think that that's one of the best ways to approach it. I think a problem that we have is that um, we're we're just getting used to this idea of legal marijuana in Canada, right? Like it's it's new for us. Twenty seventeen, yeah. marijuana was first uh, introduced, and so there is a there's a divide, and there's a divide from uh, people who are using it. So in the nineteen, you know, in uh, the nineteen eighties, early nineteen eighties. Uh, people were uh, in Canada and the United States were, were getting used to the idea of legalizing marijuana. And then in both countries, there was a hardening of opinion and Ronald Reagan's war on drugs uh, became entrenched in America and also spread to Canada. So for a number of us who grew up in that era, we would never have dreamed of using marijuana because the penalties are really quite uh, unrealistic for the possession of drugs, uh, Etc. I think the other thing that's important in just in terms of statistics is that this person listening live says that there's so much access to marijuana. They're thinking about legal marijuana. But one of the things that's very interesting is that of all the marijuana consumed in Canada, 79% of it is obtained through the black market, through the illegal market. And the reason is that it's just been much more successful at marketing marijuana. And so it's it's important to uh, to remind young people of the very uh, unrealistic and stiff penalties that there are because somebody 19 can purchase marijuana legally, but Canadian youth, youth uh, under age, under the legal age for using marijuana are actually the largest consumers of youth when you compare that, that, that cohort to youth in 29 other comparable countries. So Canadian youth seem to use more marijuana. And some of the reasons for this are felt to be around that ambivalence, as well as um, that uh, the, the unusual impact of the war on drugs. So it is difficult, I think, to stop that. The other thing I think that's really curious is that here we are in this period when marijuana has just been legalized. And I'm sure, uh, people listening will have heard about how we're now learning of even further dangers about alcohol to the point where they're advocating abstinence from alcohol. And I think that uh, when I was doing the research for the book, and uh, perhaps Dr. Kaminsky has heard about this, you know, there actually uh, are researchers in the United States who have found uh, links uh, between the use of certain substances and the the uh, and the capacity for um, the use of one substance leading to the use of another, so I, I mean I think that there's so much research still to be done, and it and we're behind in research on marijuana because during the period of the war on drugs, even for medicinal marijuana and medicinal uh, ca uh, cannabis, which was uh, looking more at the cannabinoids over looking more at the medicinal compound rather than the psychoactive compound. 
even research with those substances was prohibited and it was impossible for people to get access to marijuana to do research. So I'm optimistic that we will enter a period of research. So it, while it's, you know, while it can be difficult to manage any kind of substance use disorder, there is assistance. We have very good programming at the Royal a Rapid Access Program, uh, not just for uh, marijuana, but it, I know uh, from personal experience and the experience of the Youth Mic Program that you can you can be in touch with that program and speak with someone right away about any kind of substance use disorder. And anybody who is wondering about a substance use disorder, uh, there are always agencies to help and find out in those moments when people may really contemplate uh, changing their drug use habits. It's well said, Dr. Beck, and, and look forward to that. That book sounds like a very interesting project that's coming out uh, coming out next year. Another question here from the live chat, and I think Dr. Kaminsky, you're okay to answer this one. I'm going to send it over to you. This comes in from a, a, a viewer tonight who says, my nephew is 13 years old, has ODD and ADHD. His sister, who is my niece, is eight years old, is autistic. Uh, my nephew has mentioned that he has thought about suicide. I have brought him to a mental health clinic, which he is no longer going to. What else can I do to help him? Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll start with this. And if uh, anyone wants to add on to what I, uh, I have to add, uh, by all means, please do so. You know, I think it's important to keep in mind that, um, uh, you know, not all levels of suicide are, you know, at a super high risk. So just thinking of suicide, having passive thoughts of suicide is not necessarily as dangerous as um if they also have a plan or have intention uh, for that plan as or means to act on that plan, right? So um, it can also um, be the case that suicide comes and goes, right? So suicidal thought comes and goes, right? So someone can uh, think about suicide at one point and then it can, um, it can get better. And it sort of relates a bit to that diathesis stress that I was talking about. You know, during periods of stress or distress, people may be feeling more suicidal um, or not. So one of the things we can do in the moment is really to safety plan. It's to think about, well, when that suicidal thought is high, um, you know, what am I going to do? And we can think of doing something in the short term and something in the long term, right? So, you know, talk to your youth, um, you know, try to understand what level of suicidality are they at? You know, have they have they thought about it, but they they haven't really thought about a way that they would do it um, they haven't thought about, uh, you know, they haven't gotten what they would need to do it, you know, understanding where they're at sort of gives you a, a feeling of how severe things are. So, you know, if they have a plan, it's, it's much more serious than, than if they don't, if they, you know, uh, ha like if they're going to use pills, for example, and they have those pills, um, then you can also, uh, use that information to, as part of safety planning to diffuse that plan, ask them if they'll, the, if they'll entrust you with what they would need. Um, so have something in the short term, have them have access to crisis lines like the 988 number or kids help phone if they want to text in, um, uh, you know, have them have a list of people that they trust uh, and that they can call like your yourself, your parent, or maybe a coach or something that they trust. Um, and, uh, you know, the long-term str uh, strategies are really into getting into help and getting treatment um, around that. So, you know, just, you know, to summarize, just thinking about suicide isn't isn't the end of the world. Um, it, you know, but it's important to, to dig further and really understand, um, you know, how serious that is and start putting contingencies or safety plans uh, in place. And there's lots of resources for how to safety plan if you want to look into it further. Yeah, I would love to just piggyback on that. And uh, uh, absolutely, Dr. Kaminsky, doing a safety plan together um, is it can be pivotal. Um, and I know in my practice, I, I look at suicidal thoughts um, as problem solving. And so the question becomes, what's the problem? Um, and, and being willing to kind of explore that with people, often it's about relationships and feeling excluded. Um, and so I would encourage anybody, if they've connected with counselors in the community, if there's another person that they can link with, um, to wrap around and make sure that that person's feeling connected, that could be an important part of that safety plan too. 
Yeah, well said. Well, I think we've got time for one more question here. Um, and it comes in here from, from again, one of the attendees tonight. And I'm not sure whose uh, lane of expertise is best. So I'm just going to read out the question. And again, uh, whoever feels like they they, they want to jump in or, or feel um, that they want to answer this one, it would be great. Um, my daughter has a diagnosed generalized anxiety disorder for which she is taking medication. I'm pretty sure she smokes cannabis multiple times a week. Should I be worried about potential brain health issues? Anybody? Uh... Maybe I'll start because there's a medication question. Yeah. Um, and I'll just start and say the main worry that we have with somebody who is uh, on a medication for a mental health condition and using cannabis is that sometimes the cannabis can interfere with the effectiveness of the medication. So that's something to think about. The other thing to think about is that um, uh, it's, uh, and I think that the that all of these clinicians, Sydney as well, is that it's difficult to gauge from reports how much cannabis somebody is using. I think that that's another element and I think that um, people will find that in uh, small amounts, and I hear this from a lot of patients, that in small amounts, they feel that cannabis helps with their anxiety. But in fact, that may not be the case. And so uh, sitting down, there are lots of resources online about cannabis and, and reviewing with that, uh, reviewing with your child, what some of the effects can be to, to make sure that uh, uh, to make sure that they understand the possible risks of cannabis would be an important thing. I think the other thing is that um, for any drug that you might use, the impact of that drug uh, on the on the brain, and in this case, in cannabis's case, because it can affect the developing brain, is that it's not like a there's not necessarily a dose correlation in the sense that no doubt about it, using more uh, will probably have a greater impact than using less, but that from one person to the next, the amount that can have an impact may vary. And so we really, you know, those of us uh, who were concerned about the legalization of cannabis really had hoped that there would be a better public health campaign around the time it was legalized. We also hoped that there would be, uh, a bit in that public health campaign, a lot more explanation of the impact that cannabis can have on the developing brain. Um, again, uh, a, a family physician, and on occasion, if you are really concerned, because you can see, for a number of reasons, a deterioration in a person's learning capacity, because of lack of motivation, uh, and uh, other reasons, as a clinical psychologist can assist with uh, not just psychoeducational diagnoses, but diagnosing uh, a cannabis use disorder in general, and uh, your family physician or uh, a child psychiatrist or general psychiatrist can also assist. And it's important to try and use those resources. Yeah, yeah. And, and Rob, I, I think you've, you've passed along uh, some info here. Yeah. So the only thing I was going to add on to this is I think, you know, a lot of what Gail says for sure, Dr. Beck has said is, you know, I, I definitely agree with, and I, I, I'm going to sort of bring this to um, kind of a recent example in, in, in practice when I think, I think there's, there's a person who uses cannabis, but they may not necessarily understand what it is that they're using anyway, because there's so many different types of strains, THC, CBD, heightened potency in certain areas. And some youth that I work with, they know they smoke cannabis, but they don't know what it contains and what the heavy strain is, right? And so we even think about, you know, cannabis as a tool to help relax. What they're often referring to is the CBD um, aspects of cannabis, not the THC, which is like the psychedelic or psychotropic aspects of it, which is going to increase like paranoia, actually strengthen anxiety um, and make you have more of that high feeling. 
So I've included in the chat, um, uh, it was published by CAMH, the Center of Addiction and Mental Health on low risk uh, cannabis consumption guidelines. So that um, anybody who's interested can, can look into what is considered safe consumption of cannabis. And it actually does a really good job of defining um, those uh, those difference, the differences between like THC, CBD, it's also dosages because one of the things I've learned in youth psychiatry is that it's not just about a joint or a bong anymore. No. <laughs> <laughs> they're doing things in edible formats and dab pens and this, that, and the other thing. And they're like, oh, I just have a couple cartridges of this. I'm like, how much is that in a in a joint? And they have no idea. I have no idea. So I defer to this. Yeah. No, thanks for uh thanks for for sharing that because it, these are important resources, as Dr. Beck said even earlier. Like these are changing times, things that didn't exist in terms of legalization 15, 20 years ago, and that were we're navigating it uh, at navigating it now. So uh, listen, I think we're all, all out of time here. This this ninety minutes, quite frankly, flew by. It felt like twenty minutes for me, uh, sitting in this host chair. So I want to thank everybody for watching uh, along here, and and certainly a huge thanks to Dr. Gail Beck, to Rob, uh, to Sarah, uh, to to Zach, uh, to Dr. Kaminsky for for joining us here because I think um, this was fantastic. And and for anybody who missed part of it, or maybe you want to share this with friends. Good news, the team of the Royal has recorded this. They're going to post it on uh, the Royal's website. They're going to pump it out on social media. And uh, they can send along the link in case you want to, as I mentioned, maybe you missed some of it. Maybe you want to share it uh, with some people in your life. And what we're really hoping is that, you know, you walk away today feeling better equipped to support people. I think of what Rob said, of you know, run towards the danger. That's really one of the great messages that I think came out of this today. Just, just feel empowered. Don't be afraid to have those conversations with the youth in your life run towards the danger and, and, and you're going to like where you come. It might be uncomfortable at first, but you're going to like the outcome in the long run. And um, we, we we also want you to know that, you know, like I said, Rob and Sarah was so great in that, uh, in that middle segment. And they actually have an article that is up on, on the Royals website entitled how parents and caregivers can support the teens and young adults in their lives. So for kind of a summation of the tips that, that Rob and Sarah passed along, check out the Royal website, check out that article, how parents and caregivers can support teens and young adults in their lives. Before we let you go, I know it's February, but we're looking ahead to March. And we wanna tell you about something that uh, the Royal does every March, uh, every March, which is hosting the Mental Hygiene Challenge. And this is a pretty cool initiative. Uh, it's basically encouraging people in our community to spend 10 minutes a day taking care of our mental health by practicing one of 16 approved exercises by experts. So you got a wide a range of things. You don't have to just pick one. There's 16. You can, there's lots of variety for you to pick one of these things and spend 10 minutes a day doing it. And it's super customizable. It's super simple. And you know what, as we talk about how do you start conversations within the youth in your life, prioritizing mental health, building healthy habits, this is a great way to do it. You might, you have a teenager and they might ask you, what are you doing now every 10 minutes every day? You can say to them, I'm doing the Royals Mental Hygiene Challenge. And so, um, you know, people think it's pretty obvious, right? When they tell us about our teeth and dental hygiene, right? And we know that we have to sh shower and brush our teeth and do all those things. I think it's time we start applying those same concepts to our, our mental health and mental health hygiene. So good mental hygiene uh, helps us build the resilience that we've talked about to face some of those challenges that are in the future. And it's certainly valuable for our youth who are navigating so many of those things that we never had to deal with, but it's on their doorstep. So uh, we want to invite you to take part in the challenge. It runs the entire month of March, the 1st to the 31st, but you can learn more. Sign up now through the link that we've just popped into the live chat. So hopefully you'll consider participating in that and, uh, and maybe turning it into a family activity in the month of March. Again, thank you everybody for, for tuning in here and thank you everybody for organizing this and we'll see you next time.